Welcome back. So our next speaker is going to be Giovanni Amelino Camellia from the University of Rome uh, Sapiens. And he's going to talk about the fate of Lorentz symmetries at the Planck scale and other scales. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm hopefully taking an angle which is uh, usefully complementary to the one Maxime chose for his presentation. So um, Maxime gave us a nice overview of testing Lorentz symmetry from the most basic and necessary perspective. It is a, something we hold as fundamental, so our job is to also scrutinize uh, those uh, laws, those theories, which we consider as fundamental, perhaps, perhaps more than any others. I mean, those who are most fundamental, we should be scrutinizing uh, most uh, carefully. And, uh, and also, the perspective of his talk was focused on the uh, most basic uh, way in which we can test a symmetry by comparing it to test theories which break the symmetry. Okay? This is uh, kind of uh, an absolutely necessary uh, job we should do just because Lorentz symmetry uh, plays such a crucial, pivotal role in our theories. Um, and, and, and we have had a few months of uh, discussion in the physics community because of the preliminary opera result. Uh, we, have, we have had a few months of discussion matching perfectly uh, the, this, this attitude uh, where um, there are some data which are still to be scrutinized um, that might have suggested Lorentz symmetry to fail in a regime where we would never have expected it to fail. Okay. Um, I'm going to say very little about that, but instead I'm going to take a complementary attitude and ask and actually remind you of uh, work that suggests that actually there is a regime in physics where if Lorentz symmetry failed, it would not be so surprising. Right? It's just very, very different from the regime opera has access to. And in doing that, I will instead take as a main logical perspective the distinction between scenarios where you break Lorentz symmetry and scenarios where you deform Lorentz symmetry. Uh, to make this uh, deformed Lorentz symmetry concept, which after many years still is uh, puzzling to many, uh, as uh, vivid as possible. I will also take one particular example of quantum space-time where the notion of the form Lorentz symmetry applies and discuss it briefly for you. But of course, all this will be aimed at discussing phenomenology. And of course, this is, a, from my perspective, the task, the challenges for the phenomenology are uh, much more severe because I'm not contemplating Lorentz symmetry being uh, violated at GEB scales, but at the distant Planck scale. So I will even have to convince you that uh, it is even possible to study, to develop a phenomenology for these effects. So, and I stress it again, rather than thinking oh, we have this symmetry, let's test it in any way possible, let's introduce the very, very, very many parameters that could possibly violate this symmetry, I'm going to go in the opposite direction. Which hints, if any, we have that Lorentz symmetry might not hold exactly in nature. Okay. And uh, this is actually also not a very young literature, uh, but it's uh, useful to use it use the history of this field in some sense, even as a way to introduce the concepts. So this is the Planck scale, you all know. And uh, how we have come gradually to suspect that this scale somehow has an interesting interplay with Lorentz symmetry. And uh, I start, 
it's useful for, I'm not, I don't want to do the historical perspective, but it's kind of the logical perspective also. I start from where the situation was with respect to this issue uh, nearly 20 years ago. Up to the mid-1990s, there was little or nothing about departures from Lorentz symmetry at the Planck scale. And yet, in modern, these are ancient times, but in modern perspective, uh, it's surprising that in those days there was already a very sizable literature suggesting that the Planck scale might set the maximum momentum of a microscopic particle. Uh, a large literature suggesting that the Planck scale could set the minimum allowed wavelength for a particle. The quantum gravity literature was already filled with such results and proposals. Areas have a discrete spectrum. This was already a claim very popular 20 years ago and the quantization scale is the Planck length. How well can we localize an event in space-time when we take into account both quantum mechanics and general relativity? Already 20 years ago, the Planck length was described as an absolute limit on the localization of an event in space-time. And yet, no discussion, basically no discussion of an interplay between the Planck scale and Lorentz symmetry. But you can easily see that any of these points any of these points are very vivid invitations to contemplate a non-trivial role for Planck scale and Lorentz symmetry. I became early on quite concerned about the minimum wavelength. The most popular of these ideas is that the Planck length sets the minimum wavelength <coughs> in physics. Well, how can you discuss that and not worry about the implications for Lorentz symmetry? Wavelengths are not invariants in special relativity. So the statement, the Planck length sets the minimum wavelength, is meaningless in a special relativistic theory. The minimum wavelength for which observer? Because any particle which has wavelength, Planckian wavelength for one observer, will not have Planckian wavelength for another observer. For a boosted observer, it would have a shorter wavelength. The minimum wavelength in special relativity, this is one of the theorems, uh, the most trivial one, is zero. And if we discover one day that the minimum wavelength is not zero, special relativity is falsified. Okay, so if we ever discovered that the minimum allowed wavelength for particles has a certain finite value, that single measurement falsifies special relativity. Okay? It's an obvious, I mean, this is physics 1-1 in the, one, in the United States. Yet it did not show up in the literature up to 20 years ago when all these concepts were already extremely popular in the quantum gravity literature. <coughs> what it took, and this came up uh, strangely in a flare of results toward the end of the 1990s, what it took to bring to a wider attention the fate of Lorentz symmetry in quantum gravity research were some results which appeared over a span of a few years in a few, not all of course, but in a few of the approaches which are studied as candidate solutions to this quantum gravity problem, there started to be results suggesting that the on-shell relation, dispersion relation for particles, when studied with Planck scale accuracy, would not take its special relativistic form. The leading order corrections in different models are predicted to be uh, different, actually more than I've described here, there could be Peter Fringens, but the main differences between models that predict a linear effect in the Planck length or a quadratic leading order effect in the Planck length. Well, once these results started to be produced, then, okay, this was screaming loud enough and everybody started to, uh, well, at least everybody involved in these research areas, the areas, there is no pointer uh, somehow? And, um, well, at least all those involved in this research communities uh, started to take notice that evidently something was being funny about Lorentz symmetry. Uh, but then, uh, but then the, the, the obvious puzzle was what is going on with Lorentz symmetry? <coughs> discovered that this cannot be a special relativistic situation, but what situation is it? And 
of course, I will, I will qualify this, of course, in a few slides. Of course, the first attempts were, <coughs> well, evidently these theories, which by the way, we don't understand very well. So <laughs> we, in some sense, they are theories we write, but we speculate about what they do. In particular, it was at those, in those days perfectly legitimate to speculate that these theories would be theories with a preferred frame, with a, some sort of quantum gravity ether. Okay. This is basically the framework of Maxim's presentation. Every, every one of these parameters in these field theory constructions are parameters of the ether. Okay. And we were starting to play on the quantum gravity side, the result of these results, uh, following these results, with the idea that, well, these theories at least, not necessarily quantum gravity, but these candidate theories of quantum gravity maybe have a quantum gravity ether. And uh, there was, I remember, a lot of discussion then about, well, what is this preferred frame? Maybe it's the CMBR frame. Maybe the CMBR frame is the preferred frame of quantum gravity. And this is, uh, I'm describing it a bit as if it was an obsolete idea, but this is, uh, you know, by scientific standards, this is a well-defined idea, a testable proposal. And so there is still now, uh, even from the quantum gravity side, uh, a sizable research effort ongoing, uh, studying this idea of plan scale broken Lorentz symmetry. You, you'll find it sometime using these uh, acronyms LIV or LSB for suggesting that Lorentz symmetry is violated, broken uh, very crudely in such frameworks. And essentially related to the points Maxim was making earlier, uh, these ways to modify, to affect Lorentz symmetry are rather virulent. And in spite of what, it, so I'm already giving up one of the points that are, that are on my agenda. In spite of being introduced at the Planck length, at the minute Planck length, at the huge Planck scale, and uh, even setting aside any concerns about, you know, even assuming there is screening of the effects at lower energies so that there is no uh, kind of feeding of the Planck scale ultraviolet structure at lower scales, even confining them at the Planck scale, we have very strong limits, at least applicable to the case of linear well, of linear, uh, the top case for the broken Lorentz symmetry scenario is already up to loopholes, and there are loopholes, but uh, up to loopholes, it's, it's excluded, meaning that uh, most of the, of the natural ways in which you could study this are already excluded experimentally. So presently, the frontier for Planck scale broken Lorentz symmetry, or if you want, the frontier for the search of the quantum gravity ether, if you want, uh, is now the target are mainly quadratic effects. What, what has changed starting, you know, already more than a decade ago, but this is already old, but the newest idea on the subject, is that we started to realize that <clears throat> there was also another way. So rather than crudely breaking Lorentz symmetry, we could uh, do something smoother. Uh, deforming Lorentz symmetry is the idea of introducing new laws, laws which are not special relativistic, but then insisting that Together with the introduction of the new laws, you also introduce laws of transformation between observers, which are accordingly modified. So that you preserve the relativity principle. You preserve the Galilean principle of equivalence of frames, but you introduce a new law, and as a result, if you preserve the relativity principle, but you have new laws, then you have necessarily new laws of transformation between observers. All these will be clear. I'm, I'm surprised it's still confusing after a decade, but it will be clearer once I do a kind of uh, historical analog of all this. But let me first set the logical scheme. So we have the leaf, the broken Lorentz symmetry, the quantum gravity ether scenarios, which require a preferred frame, 
laws of transformation between observers are still special relativistic. This is often not emphasized, but implicit in all these analyses is that you assume that the laws of transformation between observers are still special relativistic, but you have introduced a law, could be the on shared relation I'm talking about, you introduce a law which is itself not special relativistic, so that law basically can be used to single out a preferred frame. And the formalization, however, is very simple. We could even use, as was emphasized, we could even use just our good old-fashioned field theory and add some parameters. This would be the parameters of the ether and do the calculation just the way we are used to doing them. You deform symmetries. This would go under the acronym of DSR in some of the literature. Um, then you, you avoid having a preferred frame description at the cost of changing the laws of transformations between observers with respect to the special relativistic case. And there must be a logical consistency. The, the relativity principle then introduces a technically and mathematically challenging task, which is then whichever new law you introduce, you can introduce laws which are not special relativistic. But whichever law you introduce, it must be properly consistent with some relativistic law. Not with special relativity, but with some new relativity, necessarily it must be. And so this brings the whole field into an arena where you have to develop formalism. You cannot add parameters to existing formalism. You have to introduce the new mathematics that will govern uh, the new relativistic theory. And since indeed it's true, after more than a decade, this uh, simple concept escapes uh, a large fraction of the community, let me make it, hopefully today, crystal clear by using the analogy with the, an evolution of the relativity principles, which we all know. It, it would not be the first time that we encounter relativity principles evolving from one scheme to another. Of course, we, again, as Physics 101, we all learn that there was one day Galilean relativity, okay? Then when, uh, toward the beginning of last century, uh, this was replaced by another equally relativistic but different theory, uh, the special relativity. So Galilean relativity was giving us a non shared relation, which is the first here on the top. Then uh, crucial for my logical line is to realize which is often taken for granted, that Galilean relativity makes the non-trivial statement that the law of composition of momenta and the law of composition of velocities is linear. Okay? Only way Galilei could imagine it, of course. And uh, this set of laws, uh, of course, again, Physics 101, came under scrutiny when basically Maxwell theory showed that light, the speed of light, could be computed from other parameters. How could it be computer for, computed for other parameters when velocities are relative? Okay. It's just like I was asking 20 years ago, how can it be the minimum wavelength, the Planck length, when wavelengths are relative? Okay. And this is exactly the same historical fact. How could the speed of light be computed from certain parameters when Galileo relativity, for God's sake, 200 and more years of success, tells us that every speed is relative. For which Galilean observer is the speed of light c? This is the natural way to look at facts a century ago by every observer of the time, which was a Galilean observer. And of course, what we tried desperately, history books give a fair account of that, what we tried desperately, not us, our corresponding players of more than a century ago, what we tried desperately was to save Galilean relativity. For God's sake, what else could there be? And look for an ether. Oh, so, you know, Old-fashioned technology is always. <laughs> so what we tried at first, what Lawrence was trying desperately, in spite of having the mathematics in front of his nose, I always say our brain never reaches the point of our nose because he had the equations in front of his nose, and yet he couldn't. 
And Ma Lawrence himself was one, as you know, one of the advocates. We have to find the ether now. In modern language, they were looking for the preferred frame. They were breaking Galilean invariance. They were assuming, what else could it be? That the laws of transformations between observers were Galilean still, but they were looking for a preferred frame in which to write this funny equation that Maxwell had obtained, that the speed of light was c. Okay. And they looked desperately, because giving up on Galilean invariance appeared <laughs> too daring a step. It famously did not work. Okay. And I don't have to remind you of that story. I've reminded you already long enough. So what we learn is that Maxwell's theory was not pointing us toward a demise of relativity, because a theory with a preferred frame is simply saying there is no relativity anymore. If you have a preferred frame, the relativity principle has been given up, not any of the details of the implementation of a relativistic theory. But what we learned is that this was not happening, that there was going to be a theory no less relativistic than the Galilean one, but just with different laws of transformations between observers. Okay. Particular Galilean boosts had to be replaced with the special relativistic boosts. And indeed, again, this analogy helped me. And of course, once you change one piece of a relativistic theory, everything must change, or at least many, many things must change accordingly. A relativistic the relativity principle is the principle of consistency among many items. Okay? So you could not simply say, oh, I, I adjust my transformation law so that the speed of light is C. As a matter of fact, we hide all this to our students when we show them the way speeds combine when they are parallel in special relativity, which appears like, okay, I just adjusted the law so that the speed of light is the maximum value. We should show our students this the, the general way, the general law, this, 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 this composition of velocity, which for Galilei was, was linear and couldn't see any farther than that with the experiments available to him, we actually discovered that the composition law of two uh, velocity vectors is this very complicated thing. Not something you would have guessed by simply saying the speed of light is the maximum value. But this is because the relativity principle is a very powerful principle. If you, if you hammer somewhere, this is why I say, and I don't want to, uh, you know, it's not a kind of a prejudicial statement, but to break Lorentz symmetry is a crude action because you can hammer the theory anywhere you like, you break it. But to deform a symmetry, which was Eisen and Poincaré accomplished, uh, to deform a theory means that you hammer it in some place but then, <laughs> it, it, the, 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 that deformation that you localize, maybe by wanting to introduce the speed of light as the maximum speed, must be consistently implemented throughout the whole framework. And so you discover that the law of composition of velocities has this virulent nonlinear form, is, not even, non is even non commutative. Uh, we have discovered, with some of, uh, of my students in Rome, we have discovered papers as recent as 94. Julia, the other Julia, not our chair, but Julia Sarra had to play with papers from 94, where again there are people saying, oh, special relativity must be wrong because velocities are uh, combined non commutatively. How could that possibly be? 94. Okay. Well, 100 years still not understood well by some. Uh, crucial for my logics, hoping that this analogy now is bringing some points home, but Crucial for my analogy is also to notice something which is, again, usually taken for granted as an obvious point. Uh, the transition from Galilean relativity to special relativity modifies the law of composition of velocities, but the law of composition of momenta remains unchanged. To this day, we combine momenta using a Galilean law of composition of momenta. Because this law doesn't, this is one of, example, one of the counterexamples of what I was saying earlier. This law does not uh, you know, interfere with introducing an invariant velocity scale. <coughs> the Oshell relation does change, and famously, time becomes relative. Uh, I don't know how much time I'll spend on this later, but also crucial to understand the form Lorentz symmetry is this point. Uh, we say time is relative, but we have to remember clearly that simultaneity of distant events becomes relative. Of course, we would say, of course, 
but this is also something that could be scrutinized experimentally. Simultaneity of events in the same place is objective in Einstein as much as in Galilei. So now that I've done this exercise of <coughs> explaining what an evolution of relativity principle is uh, using the one you know, let me try to uh, imagine how a new evolution of relativity principles might shape up. Uh, so, and I'm going to use, and this is just an example, I mean, the, the, the new evolution of relativity principle could take many, many forms, but uh, I, I'll let myself be biased by these results in quantum gravity research. So I'm going to assume for the sake of this presentation that a core, a core feature of whatever this new relativity theory is, is some on shell relation which is not special relativistic. Okay? Here I have an example of what I called earlier linearly deformed. Uh, this same law, just like the speed of light law in the Maxwell days, could have been equally well an ether law, could be a property of some preferred frame, but it could have been, and it was actually in that case, uh, a property of the laws of transformation between observers from a relativistic viewpoint. Also, such a law can be studied from the two perspectives. If you study it from the perspective of preserving the relativity principle, the main challenge is to render this deformation scale a relativistic invariant. Okay. This was, again, the analogy explains it well. If you want Maxwell description of light to be relativistic, you have to find some way for a speed scale to be an invariant of the relativistic laws of transformation. Well, to some extent, it's not difficult to imagine that. Again, again, boosts are immediately under scrutiny because uh, just like speeds are not invariant under boost, and that's why from Galilei to special relativity, boost had to be changed because boosts, Galilean boosts, don't leave invariant any velocity. If you want to propose a relativistic theory with a velocity scale which is invariant, the boosts cannot be Galilean. Because the Galilean boosts change every velocity. Now, if you want to have a theory like this as a relativistic theory, again, immediately boosts must be affected. This is very, was very clear from the onset. Uh, because energies transform under uh, all energies transform. There is no invariant energy scale. Our present description of the world is that any particle we see with energy of one MeV, any time we see a photon with energy of one MeV, there is some observer, potentially, at least in our theoretical construction, where that particle has infinite energy. Every time we see a photon with wavelength of one over one MeV, there is some observer, at least in our theories, possibly somewhere in the universe, where that photon has uh, arbitrarily small wavelength, subplanckian wavelength, of course. So this is necessary. What you have to do is to find some way to deform boosts in such a way that now this thing is invariant. <coughs> so the boosts must depend on the Planck scale or whatever scale, because of course I'm using uh, a lot of my quantum gravity prejudice uh, to describe something which is not really necessarily correlated to quantum gravity. You, you uh, of course, the boosts must depend on the Planck scale. We already discovered with uh, Poincaré Einstein that boosts had to be depending, the, the, the actual the boost operator depends on the speed of light, must know about the speed of light to make it invariant. Now we would have boost generators which depend also on the new scale which could be the Planck scale. But it's interesting, I'll get to that soon, that we also this time have hints that translations are being affected. Uh, what I said earlier that the law of composition of momenta in special relativity is the same as in Galilean relativity simply is the statement of the fact that translation transformations are equally trivial in Galilean and in special relativity. Okay. Um, and instead, one immediately finds, at least when this is the type of law we want to promote to new relativistic law, uh, that also the law of composition of momenta must be deformed. And then this immediately implies that translations become non-trivial. Uh, 
again, I'm trying to make my most valiant effort to make all this understandable. And uh, so besides the analogy with the Galilean transformation, and they are very simple concepts. It just takes some time to metabolize them, uh, evidently. Uh, another effort is to just work, uh, briefly summarize what we know of one specific quantum space time. Okay? So just to show you that even if you didn't think about it, if you didn't think about uh, possibly deforming Lorentz symmetry, your mathematics might take you there. Uh, indeed, this is a, an example which is particularly well suited for these purposes, is Kappa Minkowski space time where space and time don't commute, the coordinates of space and time don't commute. And uh, the way to see, and this is not, I mean, th this happens in many non commutative space times, not exactly <coughs> this way, but similar features. And, and you can see the core property is summarized in this line. So uh, this, this field is a huge field. The Kappa Minkowski literature must be hitting a thousand papers or so since it started in the, indeed in the early 90s. And uh, there are Gordon equations that, 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 that there are attempts to do good field theories, only partially successful so far. We have good evidence that this that I've written here is a product of plane waves in Kappa Minkowski, not so surprisingly. And notice one thing, the non-commutativity of the coordinates is in some sense dual to the fact that momenta must combine in a non-trivial way. Because when you combine exponentials, the fact that the coordinates don't commute, this is not easily seen, but it's, it's easy to easily seen, but not on the blackboard. Uh, it, but it's, easily to sh it's easy to show that because of this non-commutativity, this product of exponential, when you want to see it as a, a single wave of uh, combined momentum, the combination of momenta is deformed. This is what in mathematics is called uh, a case of non-primitive co-product. So that the translations generators have uh, a sort of non-trivial property, which is basically here uh, described. That is new with respect to Lie algebra symmetries. This would be Hopf algebra symmetries. One, one speaks of Hopf algebra symmetries when this property, which I have isolated here in the simplest possible way to see it, uh, is present. And I stress that uh, there are many, I mean, this is a huge researcher which is finding uh, many encouraging results, still a long way to, do, to go. Let me advertise work that was done in, in Rome, also by our chair, by the way, so I should do it for being polite to the chair, uh, that uh, we, need, we even have good progress on generalizing the Nether theorem to cases where symmetries are described by this fancier op algebra language, uh, and in particular, how to handle the non-primitivity of the coproduct in the nether analysis. So this all works, and uh, you have seen already from these remarks that there are some of the elements that are needed to do a deformation of Lorentz symmetry. Uh, I here summarize, as I did in a recent paper, what, is, uh, what I see emerging as uh, relativistic kinematics in Kappa Minkowski. And uh, so that you can see, because probably this is one of the reasons why uh, those who don't work with it from the outside remain puzzled about this very simple idea of the form in Lorentz symmetry. Uh, we often don't show explicit formulas because they are clumsy. This is a case where at least I can show you neatly uh, explicit all order results, okay? Uh, you can easily check that all these formulas for the on shell relation, the law of composition of momenta, the action of boost of momenta, all these are formulas which in the limit where the deformation scale is taken to zero, uh, give you back special relativity, of course, just like for speed of light going to infinity, you get back relativity from special relativity. And all these give you a consistent picture of the relativistic theory. All sorts of processes and show that no process, if you use these laws, basically what you need to be comfortable with them 
is to show that no process can be used to identify a preferred frame. I will, I will give you uh, an indication of how this uh, plays a crucial role in, in a minute. So, since we are here, and not only because we are here, of course, uh, taken for granted that, uh, that you are uh, buying the idea that the form Lorentz symmetry at the Planck scale and broken Lorentz symmetry at the Planck scale are viable options. Uh, the first thing I should address in, in, in this institution, but actually in general, I think, as a quantum gravity researcher, is what happens in cosmology. Because, of course, cosmology, in principle, is the ideal laboratory for a quantum gravity researcher. The problem for us is that the Planck scale is too remote, it's too far from opera. And, uh, in fact, we have looked for roads to opera from the Planck scale, not finding any. So maybe this is very difficult, for example, to, there, there appears to be simply no way to describe something like opera with a Planck scale effect which might not be for the worst anyway. Um, instead, in cosmology, in the early universe, in describing the early universe, this would be the natural place where you would like to test ideas about quantum gravity because then, in the early universe, particle energies comparable to the Planck scale would be, you know, at, if you choose the stage of the early universe appropriately, would be even typical. So all these that I'm going to describe as small effects would be important effects in the early universe. And I remain convinced that this will be uh, the killer application of all this research at some point when somebody or a few people smart enough find the bridge between this more formal and theoretical research and the actual observational aspects of cosmology. Uh, this particular, now the particular idea of deforming Lorentz symmetry in the way I described uh, with these energy dependent effects uh, you know, clearly would have implication for causality in that early universe regime. And this was evident in the structure of these theories. Uh, and there have been attempts to exploit this already since, uh, you know, not, not much after the idea of the from Lorentz symmetry had been proposed. And uh, there is still work in progress, which I think, uh, I, I repeat, looking ahead in the future, this is the most important work that is being done. I, I'm not giving a generalized sample. I'm still biased, well, toward my work, but the work of the chair of it. So I have to, yeah. I cannot complain. Uh, but the, there is still very good work, I think, attempting to bridge this gap between these formalisms, which are a bit subtle uh, and technical, and actual observations. Uh, but, and, but, uh, but I'm sure, and, and of, of course already, and maybe Joao will tell us something about it, already the implication for causality in the, universe, in the early universe are, you know, pretty potentially significant facts, but my hope and my expectation, I should say, is that eventually, uh, uh, you know, a more pervasive role for these ideas will be found in, in study of but this is all I have to say presently on the cosmology side. And instead, let me, let me go back to instead, okay, the effects are small. They're very small. The, we study them not in the early universe, but uh, at accessible energy, if not in the laboratory, in astrophysics. So they will be very small effects. Can we dig them out? And that will describe two such ideas which are rather powerful. One is threshold anomalies and one uh, speed of propagation of particles when the effects, however, are introduced at the Planck scale. Uh, the threshold anomalies are also, besides being important in the phenomenology in general of uh, testing Lorentz symmetry, they are particularly useful and they get the spotlight today from me because they also help me render, again, more crisp the difference between breaking and deforming Lorentz symmetry. Uh, a very strong handle on testing Lorentz symmetry, uh, testing broken Lorentz symmetry, really. It's very important, even the opera, the opera 
madness, uh, even if it fades away as, as it eventually, uh, chances are, will. Um, it's interesting that it forces us to think more cleanly of what we know and what we don't know about Lorentz symmetry. And, and, and we have, I think some of us, or part of the community, is more aware now that we never test the principle. We test the test theories. So what we only measure, and this is also why I think work on deformed Lorentz symmetry is important. Um, surely biased, but I have my argument because uh, the amount of confidence we have in a given theory is never, it can never be phrased as it is being confirmed. It's always to be phrased, the alternative test theories have failed. So how well we can rely, how, how much we can trust a given theory only depends on the quality of the test theories we use to challenge it. We can never say Lorentz symmetry has been confirmed. We can only say all alternatives we have come up with, all test theories we have come up with, for all of those we have set very strong bounds. Those bounds on the alternative test theories are what we measure as our level of confidence in Lorentz symmetry. But then the quality and diversity of the test theories is crucial. Otherwise, we risk to put too much faith into something which has not been properly probed. An example is threshold anomalies, uh, much used in the literature on tests of broken Lorentz symmetry, is the fact that these threshold anomalies arise. Many of the most stringent bounds are of this type. I have here two processes which can be used for those who are new to this literature to, as an introduction to threshold anomalies. Uh, photon decay into an electron positron pair. Of course, uh, forbidden in special relativity. Well, if you break Lorentz symmetry, uh, double stressing break, if you break Lorentz symmetry above a certain scale, which is not Planckian, this is the important, it's a simple calculation, all you have to do is, to do it in the broken symmetry is always, the kinematics is really trivial, you just take your standard kinematics, but you add a modified non shell relation, you discover that the process from being forbidden becomes allowed above a certain energy scale, which is basically given by uh, the third root of Planck scale to times the square of the electron mass. So it's not a Planckian energy, this is crucial. Okay. The scale where you get the threshold anomaly is much lower than the scale where you break Lorentz symmetry. This is a signature that you're really using the hammer. You take Lorentz symmetry and you smash it and what happens is that damage is done not at the scale of, you know, not proportional to the strength of the hammer. The damage is done at much lower energies. And uh, became very, this, this is this, you know, the fact that we don't observe, and we have, you know, reasonably good data on not observing uh, photon decay into electron positron pair it can be used to set limits, and some of the best limits, uh, by the way, on broken Lorentz symmetry come from this. In the recent opera literature, you have seen uh, this process highlighted. The neutrinos of opera could have produced <laughs> electron positron pair in a sort of Cherenkov-like uh, process. And again, this process, if you break Lorentz symmetry, becomes allowed at scales much lower than the scale where you break the symmetry. Actually, opera would require you to break the symmetry uh, at 100 TeV, okay? And uh, we don't have much data on neutrinos not making electron positron pair at 100 TeV. But because, uh, you know, Cohen and Glashow were using broken Lorentz symmetry, you break the symmetry at 100 TeV, but you have actually this scale for, uh, for an electron is about 100 MeV. So opera is working in the range where electron positron pair by Cherenkov-like processes should be made. And this sets up my, uh, my point of distinction with the form Lorentz symmetry. I'm working on what I like to call a no formula theorem, just a, a theorem which can prove a, a number of facts without any formula, but just by noticing that these facts in order to be stated, require a preferred frame. And these threshold anomalies 
evidently, evidently require a preferred frame. Uh, the photon is stable up to this energy, but then can decay into electron positron pair above this energy. Well, this is just like saying the minimum wavelength. I mean, a photon is never above or below a certain energy in observer independent manner. Different observers give different energy to the photon. So if the theory were, was relativistic, so in a DSR setup, all these threshold anomalies are automatically upset. This we already know from my no formula theorem, but it's something that we can then check into every explicit construction of DSR type. Oh, I have a slide for that, yes. So if you, if you, actually, if you actually use for, just, just because I realize I have to invite people to put their hands on the form Lorentz symmetry to become comfortable, you can just play with this formula, modified on shared relation and modified conservation laws uh, that the Kappa Minkowski setup motivates, and you can compute at what scale gamma 3 plus C minus becomes allowed. It never becomes allowed same exercise that you do with broken Lorentz imagery, and you find uh, that the, the energy is absent. I mean, you don't find it. You already know from the no, from the no formula theorem, but it's nice to touch it with mathematics. Now, this said, I don't want to bias. I mean, I'm biasing the presentation toward the form Lorentz imagery just because I, I realize it's a concept that uh, it's been around for a while. It has passed uh, many, many tests, but still is confusing. But uh, uh, actually, I, I remain very interested in the case of testing broken Lorentz symmetry. And, uh, and from the broken Lorentz symmetry, you do have these threshold anomalies. Uh, now, this specific formula that I'm here using as a, a candidate of a broken Lorentz symmetry scenario is, uh, is too naive to meet other data, but of course, have, we could have, uh, you know, threshold anomalies are nearly pervasive in, uh, um, in broken Lorentz symmetry scenarios. And I, you know, since we also have experts of astrophysics here, I still want to keep an eye on what is going on with the opacity of the universe to TV photons. Uh, there, is, uh, there is this fact that uh, the, the, the photon uh, the, the, the universe should become opaque to TV photons because when they travel, there is a, an environment of targets, soft photons, in this case, the far infrared photons that can basically absorb uh, TV photons. And uh, this is the result, you know, this is the threshold. This is a process, this is a different aspect of my you know, formula theory. This is a case where there is a special relativistic threshold and the new physics can shift it, however. And the situation for the opacity of the universe, and it's, uh, as far as we can see it into the data, is becoming pretty tight. I mean, uh, one could argue that some theories do argue, uh, and the task is there for experimentalists to disprove. There is, in some sense, there is a very little window left for making theory and experiments on the opacity of TV photons. These are all essentially uh, upper bound on the opacity, if you want. And other ways, but I, the chair is. So this is for the threshold anomalies. They are useful, threshold anomalies summarizing, they are useful logically as a perhaps the clearest way to distinguish between breaking Lorentz symmetry and deforming Lorentz symmetry. And as far as can we test effects at the Planck scale uh, with the broken Lorentz symmetry, not with deformed because the threshold anomalies are absent in the deformed Lorentz symmetry, but with broken Lorentz symmetry, can we have this Planck scale sensitivity? Well, yes. Examples are this uh, opacity of the universe. And there are many more. I mean, I'm just focusing more on making conceptual points today. And to finish, just in a couple of minutes, uh, the, the easier part of the phenomenology, uh, the, the easiest example, of course, and the one that over the last uh, few weeks uh, 
uh, was much discussed, is that if you modify the on-shell relation, then depending on the sign of the deformation scale, you get uh, either what I would call subluminal corrections if they go in the direction of slowing down the particles or superluminal corrections if they go in the direction of uh, making particles faster at a given momentum than they would be in special relativity. Uh, for this aspect of such theories, as far as the speed, the determination of the speed goes, uh, there is not, not much difference between breaking and deforming Lorentz symmetry. The difference is in the implication of locality, for locality of these new uh, laws for speeds. And I will not invest much time today, but just want to, again, what happens to locality in such theories as something which is more recently understood and still uh, even more, even less metabolized, but it's actually very easy to understand, at least technical parts are subtle, but what is going on is very simple. We already know from general relativity, from actually from relativity in current space, even in the sitter space, we know that when translations are non-trivial, okay, I've, I've sticked up to flat space, but uh, we already have experience with the case when translations are non-trivial. In a current space-time basically means that translations are non-trivial and we know that when translations are non-trivial there are coordinate artifacts. The way a distant observer describes uh, what happens, you know, the way an observer describes what happens to a distant particle is misle you know, it's more subtle uh, in GR than it is in special relativity when a GR observer attributes a velocity to a distant photon, that velocity can be take any value. It can be zero, it can be infinity, it depends on uh, what is the expansion rate uh, that characterizes the analysis. Of course, local observers, local observers in GR always measure the speed of light to be one. But uh, we know very well from the general relativity context that when translations are non-trivial, we have coordinate artifacts when we try to describe these, these distant processes. And now I just mentioned and that just stressed how, for example, in the these laws here, they are just laws that mean that the translations are non-trivial. And so all this mystique about locality in DSR is simply a matter of appreciating the complexity of these new translations. And I just close down by saying that uh, even if I lower the scale to make it work with the opera anomaly, instead of the Planck scale, I could, I could think of a scale of 100 TeV. Then I could produce the opera result. If you do it DSR, if you do it deforming symmetries, you don't have these Cherenkov-like processes. Okay. But still it's, it seems so impossible to make it work. We have data on the supernova that many uh, colleagues mentioned. There are other data that to me are strongly undervalued. Data on neutrino speeds from Fermilab in 1979, at high net energies. The window of opportunity for opera is really tight. And I, and I confirm I, I haven't seen any model. Any, you know, pick a model, it doesn't work. So if, it, if which would make it all more interesting if an anomaly like that was found, or more amusing. But the state of the affair is that even DSR cannot provide, in spite of escaping the Cherenkov processes issue, uh, still cannot describe opera. And what you can do to study the speed of particles uh, is ob obviously not opera, not a prepared experiment uh, from one place to another, because the distances you would need are too big to reach a plant scale sensitivity. So what you can do is, again, astrophysics, if you study, instead of control experiment, you study in astrophysics bursty events. Okay? Events which for independent reasons, you know that they last a very short time and they're very distant from us. Then if you had that the velocity of light, of, part, of photons really, dependent on, on energy, such bursty event would leave uh, are characteristic and so far we can constrain to some level. So actually this is the way 
presently you get the best bounds on DSR, on the form Lorentz symmetry scenarios. And we are now at the level with Fermi data. I have here one particular case of Fermi observation. We have data that basically already can uh, probe DSR case, the linear Planck scale deformation. Uh, they, are, they are also probing the leaf case, but the leaf case, the broken symmetry, is further tested by other things. And since I ran late, I'll stop here with uh, not repeating the summary of the talk. Thank you. So we have uh, three. Yeah, so um, I would like to, to go back to your parallel with the special relativity. And for instance, you say uh, the relativity of, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of simultaneity uh, will translate in this new framework in uh, perhaps a relativity of, of localization. Right? This yes, is a little bit. Because so, of the translation. Yeah, so uh, there is a, a kinematical aspect in uh, Lorentz symmetry that is just uh, the fact that we know that uh, the physical events to good, uh, to good approximation transform as the Lorentz transformation say. So uh, in this sense, uh, the relativity of uh, simultaneity uh, can be tested uh, in a very precise sense uh, uh, operationally. Like uh, I can do an experiment, I put some friends, like Einstein thought, no? I put some friends on, hey, the train passes by, etc. So there is a very precise operational uh, way to say, okay, these two, two events are coincidence for one observer, but are not for, for another. Right. I don't understand uh, what, is, what are the operational implications of your new transformations. You understood too much. I mean, this is, uh, is going to force me, this one going to force me to go much higher level of discussion about this. To give you an example, so let me try to rephrase your question. So uh, relative simultaneity in the sense of uh, special relativity is something which is itself experimentally testable. The point that Federico is making is that uh, relative simultaneity is not simply saying there is no absolute simultaneity. Correct me if I'm translating incorrectly. Is not only saying that there is no absolute simultaneity. Uh, relative simultaneity makes a prediction that observers in certain condition when they determine simultaneity or lack thereof, they get a certain predictable mismatch. So what is relative locality? Which is basically, you're asking me how this, this nonlinear translation generator act. Uh, 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 there are many ways, but let me give you a very precise example uh, that matches perfectly the analogy, if I succeed. So you could have, I'm here and you're there, but we are uh, at redshift of 10, 5, distance, okay? But we are in front of us. And you shoot at me two particles parallel. You shoot at me the two particles parallel, okay? They can reach me from different angles. They can reach me at an angle between them. And all this is consistently predicted by the translation. And this is the prediction of the theory that you shoot two particles, not in general, but this is, would be a case where torsion is on momentum space, so particularly weird case. But this is something we can perfectly compute and give a perfect relativistic description of. The theory predicts in some, from some choices of the translation generators that you shoot two particles parallel to a target, and they reach a target forming an angle. Okay. And this would be you know, relative locality manifesting in, in, in a very tangible way because, you know, the observer here cannot, you know, the word lines he infers are certainly not coming from the same point. In order to figure out that they're coming from the same point, he has to first compute the word lines and then act with the translation generator and understand how the source emitted them. Is this consistent with Euclidean? Uh, I think we are a few layers beyond Euclidean and non-Euclidean. I mean, this is probably going to require eventually 
some, you know, to, to give a, while these relativistic issues we are starting to understand, but to give a proper account of this, uh, you will need to go at least to a level like this. I mean, to some level where geometry is not even Riemannian. Of any sort. Yes, but this is more non-Euclidean, if you want, you know. It's already non-Euclidean now, but we will need to further to, you know, coherently accommodate all this more non-Euclidean. I think one of the reasons why there is no sort of widespread acceptance of your theories yet, but the, indeed they are somewhat uh, challenging at the implementing them, you know, um, yeah. at, at the um, operational sense, right? Uh, just lines of you, if you have, say, a relativistic uh, quantum, uh, quantum field, totally. Uh, Rather than description, but you can include one over c squared correction, in, you know, consistently and take them into account as part of your new. Well, theory. but you never get relative simultaneity. So uh, if you if you if right. you take a special relativistic theory and you start chopping it off, as okay, I add the little parameters, you never yeah. get relative simultaneity. Uh, you get a theory which is Galilean, but with extra terms. Right. So, but the uh, I, just my question is: well, Is have you ever worked out uh, like um, one over implant correction really to the to the standard field theory? Right. So you have you have something you know that's a, a, a small parameter that controls uh, all the the new phrase your uh, your theory in limited sense and, and as a correct. Plus something else. Do I have to up the whole approach to, to you know, momentum uh, in terms of the generators? Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. But completely fair. It's just that this is work that has been tried. I mean, Michele Arzano was here in the back already. We had some works on this uh, maybe 10 years ago. And uh, there are partial results. The problem is that it cannot be kind of a standard recooking. Because if I add any of these terms in the standard way, then there is a preferred frame. That's so I have, to, I have so. to do uh, something funny. We, we have ideas, but you are probably right. I guess we have to wait until uh, we have uh, it will not be tri it will not be as trivial as people hope, but certainly at least to give you you know to give potential yeah. buyers I, some quantum field theory version. I, I, would I'm, be. I'm, I'm trying to say that uh, you know it's it's going to go beyond the regular uh, field, field. It's going right? to be so somewhat even, beyond even necessary. The one, one correction, even the first correction, will move quite different formulas. The yes, because wise. even the leading order corrections, if you do them naively in the standard way, then they give you a preferred frame. A like tiny. Like Wes did in his, uh, in his For example. His, his uh, theory has a preferred frame in the Exactly. End, right? He does not have. Uh, <laughs> he did not. Well, he just. Well, yes, this is the problem. If you do it naively, you just stick in pieces. Uh, the relativistic invariance is lost. We have. A question from there, please keep it uh, short. Yeah, this is very <laughs> short. Um, so you're right that one GeV is nothing special, but the thing about the neutrino, and if nothing oh, else, yeah. Opera made us think out of the box, okay? Yes. So one good thing about the neutrino is that the gamma factor is very high. Yes. And uh, all these ways of cooking up the form dispersion relations with the mass inside the deformation, in a way, reflect this. Wouldn't, isn't there a way to actually deform things directly, deform the group in terms of the parameter? I've never found a way, but why hasn't this been tried? I mean, I just think it's... So in other words, with deformation, not in the way which is done usually, which is in terms of the variables, but in terms of the parameter, which actually parameterizes the, the group, the Lie group. Well, I think, I mean, what you say, uh, let me try. I mean, it's a, you are asking a very complex set of ideas, but one point which is relevant to what I was saying is, uh, I'm, you know, we have 
you know, chances are this opera anomaly will, will go away and independently of any loose cables, when, when, when we see such an anomaly, uh, at least our generation, we are never, <laughs> it always goes away. Okay, we have but our, yeah, but forget about opera. But if we, you know, e we, we still have to pursue it and I'm sure, I mean, our discussion that, you know, we have had two speakers so far and we both said that we cannot find the craziest theory. I mean, I think it's true that nobody has kind of allowing for any amount of craziness, something that however smoothly fits all data we have on neutrinos. Okay? The opera data itself, yes, but, uh, but still we have to do the experiment. And if this anomaly resists, then we should explore, I think I agree with you some of the things you said. I mean, one feature which I agree with you should not be lost out of sight is that neutrinos are GV scales, but for neutrino being at the GV scale, corresponds to a boost factor with respect to the rest frame, which is comparable to the one of, of a cosmic ray proton, if you think about it. A cosmic ray proton is just about to a gamma factor of that order. So, you know, it could be. So the measurement must be redone. But I, I, I kind of uh, determinately did not want to invest, you know, this, this, this is Planck scale physics, and, and, and I didn't want to investigate too much the over anomaly which independently of loose cables, as every anomaly you and I have seen over 20 years of being physicists, they always go away. So let's wait if it sticks around. And I think these ideas, however, stick around in the sense that, you know, if you have uh, Planck scale theories where you want to play with the idea of a minimum wavelength set by the Planck length, then you have to do something with this, as I said. I mean, there is no way out. There is no cheap, no, no completely cheap way out. Minute uh, question and one minute reply. Okay. Uh, coming back to the issue raised by Maxim, once your symmetry is deformed and you have a small parameter, you should be able to write the effective field theory that Maxim oh, asked. This is However, wrong. this will not be able to uh, describe all possible Lorentz transformations that you would like, obviously, and therefore it should be valid only for a class <coughs> of boost that would be small. And ah. that is the way, in fact, you should be able to compare it with uh, measurements which are far away from the Planck scale. Well, but the problem is that a boost, a boost is never small, you know. You know, there is never one frame but which that, is... That already when you but I don't have it. How do I pick it up? But anyway, this is, I mean, I'm not sure I understand in the detail of your proposal, but I also think this is some idea which might help uh, the work that Michele and I did years ago, is true, it was too ambitious. In the sense we wanted the field theory, which even for small energies could be probed in any direction. And uh, for independent reasons, I think they're independent from yours, but I agree with your point. I mean, it's interesting to understand for a theory with the form symmetry, what could be a limited scope field theory, some kind of field theory that you can apply within a certain range of something. It's just that I cannot make sense of small boosts with respect to some frame when no frame is preferred for me. But maybe I'm being naive. I, I'd like to probe you on that afterwards, surely. Okay, thank you very much.